Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Um, today we have Brittany Miller from Co College and she's gonna give us a brief introduction to composition operators. I'm excited for this talk, so thanks Brittany. Yep, and thanks Chris for sending the invitation and to all the other otter organizers. <laughs> um, I haven't been able to make it to too many of these, so I hope the pace um, is acceptable. <laughs> and I was saying earlier, I haven't really thought too much about my research um, in maybe like the last year and a half. I've had some other competing interests for, for my time. Um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to um, sort of jump back into things and sort of get me thinking about uh, my, my line of research since I graduated. So um, the, the big ideas here, um, I'll give um, sort of a little bit of motivation for why we study composition operators. And then the first main part of the talk will be on um, really some results that, that come from Carl Cowan and Barbara McClure's book on composition operators on spaces of analytic functions. Um, and then the second part of the talk will be on my, um, my PhD work and then a few things that have come after that. Okay. Um, so we'll just um, start with our definition here of a composition operator. We'll use the symbol phi, we'll call that the symbol of operator. Um, and that's a map of some set X, um, typically in the complex plane. And so C phi applied to F of X is just the function composition of F composed with phi of X. Um, again, here X is just coming from some uh, larger set um, and uh, we'll let CFI act on Banach spaces of complex valued functions. For most of the talk, I'll focus on the Hardy Hilbert space, which I'll quickly review the definition when we need it, and a few other sort of special um, classical spaces um, of analytic functions. So, uh, why exactly do we want to study composition operators? And this um, is actually very nicely tied to the shift operator, the backward shift in particular on little l2. And so we know we can associate with any sequence um, a function where we just map each natural number to the, to the corresponding number in the sequence in that position. And if we let phi um, be the function phi of n equals n plus one, then uh, when we apply that to our sequence, it just shifts it backwards by one. And so we know that there um, are very strong ties between this type of shift operator and lots of other um, open problems in operator theory. And um, in particular, they're tied to multiplication operators um, or toplets operators. And the shift invariant subspaces uh, from, from Berling's theorem we know, um, we're able to classify those. And so um, there's sort of this big open question of, you know, can we use composition operators to then um, determine other invariant subspaces and, and solve the in invariant subspace problem? And then sort of on a more um, application side of things, um, it turns out um, composition operators appear in physics and, and more specifically in dynamical systems. And I had um, an opportunity to learn uh, a very little amount about what are called Koopman operators. And they're just these composition operators um, that um, preserve um, a system's global nonlinear features. And the goal is to use these types of operators to understand the evolution of functions in, in some given state space. And um, moreover, a Koopman operator, a composition operator is a data-driven embedding. And it has um, a lot of potential here to 
do some nonlinear prediction and estimation um, and some control in strongly nonlinear dynamical systems. Um, so I had this really cool opportunity to go to this workshop at the Berkeley lab um, and learn a little bit about what some of their computing groups do. And it turns out that they're really interested in the eigenfunctions that are associated with these composition or recruitment operators. Um, but their techniques are, um, are a little bit different um, in particular because they're, they were a computing group. They were using something called non-dynamic mode decomposition um, and some like deep learning things that I had no idea about. But <laughs> it was really interesting to learn that there are these applications that I had never really encountered before. So um, just a little bit of background on the types of spaces that um, will let our composition operators act on. Um, so sort of a, a very general setup um, is to have a functional Hilbert space on some underlying set X where um, it satisfies these four properties. So the vector operations are pointwise. Um, if f of x equals g of x for every x, then f must equal g. If f of x equals f of y for every f in the Hilbert space, then x has to equal y. And um, the linear functional um, that takes f to um, the point evaluation of f at x is continuous. And um, so we'll just call these types of spaces Hilbert spaces of analytic functions. And so because we know this, um, this linear functional is continuous, um, the Reese representation theorem guarantees that we can find what we call reproducing um, kernels. These functions we'll call k sub x, um, where when we take the inner product of f with k sub x, then that gets us um, or reproduces the value of f at x. And so uh, we'll be a little more, we can be a little more specific <laughs> and call our Hilbert spaces now reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And so the Hardy space is probably the, the classical, the most classical one that we study composition operators on. Um, this is the closed, sub, um, the closed subspace of a big L on the circle. And we can represent its norm in a couple of ways. And so we have um, sort of this integral representation of the norm where we integrate around the circle, the modulus of f of e to the i theta squared. But um, if we represent instead f as a power series, um, then f is in this Hardy space if its coefficients are square summable. And the sort of natural inner product follows. Um, again, we can either write it in its integral form or in, um, in a series. And the reproducing kernels in this particular space, um, if alpha is a point in the disk, then k alpha will say is one over one minus alpha bar z. And so that um, reproducing kernel sort of reappears in some interesting places later on. But some other spaces that uh, we might study composition operators on um, include the Bergman space. So this is um, a little bit larger of a space in the Hardy space where now the coefficients aren't just square summable, but um, we have to divide by n plus one. And again, there's an integral representation for the norm as well, the norm squared. Um, and again, it has uh, sort of this natural inner product um, in the Bergman space. And then we'll make note of the reproducing kernels here in the Bergman space. They look very similar to the reproducing kernels in the Hardy space, but now we have that denominator being squared. And then um, one more specific space that I'll point out is the Dirichlet space. And I've chosen this norm. Um, there are several norms we could use for the Dirichlet space, but um, here we notice that really what will um, qualify a function to be in the Dirichlet space is that this integral 
of the modulus of f prime squared, this area integral is finite. Um, but we add this additional term to the norm squared um, just so that the norm of zero is zero and the norm of one is one. So we can normalize if we want. And again, we have this uh, series representation as well um, for the Dirichlet space. Um, we'll come back to this, but we'll notice that this integral here is um, really an integral that measures or counts the, the area of the function applied to the disk counting multiplicity. Um, and again, we can sort of follow this along with um, the corresponding inner products here. The reproducing kernels are a little bit <clears throat> different here on the Dirichlet space. Um, where we have one over alpha bar z and then the log of what looks like the reproducing kernel in the Hardy space. So these are just some specific examples of, of our Hilbert spaces of analytic functions. Most of the results, all of the results will apply to the Hardy space. Most of them can also be applied to the Bergman space, but not all of them um, work in the Dirichlet space. And just making it even a little bit more broad, um, we have other Hilbert spaces, um, in, in particular what we call weighted Hardy spaces. And these, um, again, are going to be analytic functions on the disk where the monomials, so um, right, the different powers of z, constitute a complete orthogonal set of non-zero vectors in H. So it should be clear um, that the Hardy space and the Bergman space and the Dirichlet space are um, in fact weighted Hardy spaces. But uh, more generally, if we pick a weight sequence, we'll call it beta of n um, to be the norm of z to the n, the monomial z to the n, um, then we can define um, the, the norm squared on f in this way, where we're summing um, the, the squares of the weights with the moduli of the coefficients, the squares of those. Um, and again, we can write down a nice inner product for these. Um, and so in particular, if beta, beta of n, excuse me, is one for all n, then that corresponds exactly to our Hardy space. Um, if beta of n is one over root n plus one, that gives us the Bergman space. Um, and if beta of n is the um, square root of n plus one, then that gives us the Dirichlet space. But um, there's a whole you know, class of other weighted Hardy spaces we could consider if we really wanted to. Um, there are also weighted Bergman spaces. There are also spaces we could define on the ball, um, weighted or not Hardy and Bergman spaces. So just a lot of spaces where, um, again, some of the results that are already known will apply to many of them, but there are still a lot of open questions um, in spaces that are not the Hardy space. So our main goal is to look at composition operators on these spaces and um, to connect the properties of those operators with their symbols. So we want to learn something about the operator C phi um, by looking at the, the sort of function of feed itself. And so again, just a reminder of, our, of what a composition operator is. Um, throughout the rest of the talk, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> uh, phi will map the disk to itself. Um, it'll be an analytic map. And, um, and again, we will define C phi of F as F composed with phi. So one of the first questions perhaps that we ask about operators um, is whether or not they're bounded. And so um, Cowan and McClure, and again, most of the results I take from this first part of the talk will be from their book. Um, Cowan and McClure showed that, in fact, um, every composition operator on the Hardy space and the Bergman space are bounded, and they give bounds. Um, and so 
uh, we, we can see them here. Again, they, they look very similar because of how their norms are related. Um, they, you know, the bounds for the norm of CP and H2 um, are the square roots of the bounds um, of CP and A2. But even a little more specific than that, um, right, these, this inequality holds for any composition operator, right, as long as phi is an analytic self-map of the disk. Um, but even more specific than that, if we know um, that our symbol is an automorphism of the disk, then we can say exactly uh, what the norm is I've called C psi here. Um, and so again, in the Hardy space, it's going to look very similar to the norm in the Bergman space. We've got this one over psi of zero over one minus psi of zero to the half. Um, and we also notice, right, that these bounds only uh, depend on phi at, at zero. So that's a really nice result, I think, in general. The sort of outline of the proof um, is to start with, um, start by proving what um, the boundedness looks like on automorphisms, and then to um, extend that to using the Littlewood subordination theorem um, and for the low, to get the upper bound, and then to get the lower bound um, to apply the adjoint, which I'll talk about later on in the talk, um, but to apply the adjoint to the reproducing kernel at zero, which is the same as the reproducing kernel of phi of zero. Um, and so that gets, that will get us the lower bound, um, just sort of as a, a really <laughs> rough sketch of the proof. It also turns out that these, um, these inequalities, uh, if uh, we are applying these to, to F, um, these inequalities hold for inner functions. So we know quite a bit about what, um, what types of composition operators are bounded um, on H2 and A2. On the other hand, um, in the Dirichlet space, not all composition operators are bounded. So um, if CF is bounded on the Dirichlet space, then um, F of Z equaling Z, which is in the Dirichlet space, would tell us that when we apply CF to this particular monomial, um, then that returns phi, which must be in the Dirichlet space. And um, so in order for the norm uh, squared of F to be finite, um, again, this integral here where we have the modulus of F prime squared, um, that's the Jacobian, uh, or we could um, write that as a Jacobian matrix of F. And so this integral really represents the area of the image of F on D, counting multiplicity. So if, um, if we have a phi that is in, when I'll just give in my example, an infinite to one map, um, then this integral is not going to be finite. And so indeed, if we have something like e to the z plus one over z minus one, um, this is an infinite to one map on d to d. So, um, right, we have infinite many, infinitely many copies of the um, unit circle or uh, the unit disk, excuse me. And so therefore the, the norm of F squared is not gonna be, um, the norm of phi squared, excuse me, is not going to be bounded. So C phi in, for this particular phi is not bounded. So there are some strange things that can happen in some of our other um, weighted Hardy spaces. And so we have to be a little bit careful um, with what results we're really using um, to apply to these different spaces. Okay, I'm gonna take a slight detour before talking about compactness, which again is another sort of natural question to ask about our operators when they're compact. Um, so one of probably the, I guess, main 
uh, theorem in Cowan and McClure's book is on um, a, a, what they call the model for iteration. Oop. I think these are out of order. Okay, well, let me talk about compactness first and then, <laughs> and then I'll talk about the model for iteration. Um, so they have um, this theorem, again, in the Hardy or the Bergman space, we know that CFI is compact um, if and only if we have um, a sequence of functions that's bounded that converge to zero uniformly on compact subsets. Um, and then that implies that um, Fn composed with phi converges to zero in H. So um, this is an if and only if statement, right? CFI is compact if, if that condition holds. And um, from this, it should be clear um, that, the, that the closure um, of the image of phi on the disk, um, if that's a subset of the disk, then phi is compact. And so we see in a couple of examples here, um, if, our, if our symbol is one half z, um, then yes, CP is compact because it maps the disk um, entirely inside the unit disk. But if phi is one half z plus a half, then CP is not compact um, because again, the closure of the image of phi on the disk is, is not a subset, um, right? So the, the closure in, includes the point one. So, When I first saw this, I was a little surprised because um, these two symbols don't seem that different, <laughs> but they, they give very different, different results about the compactness of their composition operators. Um, and then a few other results about compactness um, relate to, um, in, in the first theorem I have here on this slide, um, is that if, B is univalent or of bounded multiplicity is fine, and it has no finite angular derivatives at any point on the circle, then C B is compact on H2. Um, but in fact, we can um, drop sort of the first hypothesis there. When we move to A2, that phi, um, if phi has no angu finite angular derivative at any point on the circle, in fact, C B is compact on the Bergman space and vice versa. So this one is an if and only if. And so again, I think these results are nice in the sense that um, we have to be careful with, uh, you know, what we're assuming about the spaces that we're working in. And in some ways, the Bergman space, um, you know, has sort of like simpler <laughs> um, hypotheses here, but um, it's actually quite a bit trickier to work in. Um, and I'll when I move into talking about the adjoints on these spaces, I, I hope to convince you of that. Okay, so um, again, sort of, I think one of the, the main things in Cowan and McClure's book is um, this model for iteration, which um, has to do with the Dondra Wolf point of, of functions of analytic maps. Um, so, I think we've seen this in a couple of other talks this semester, um, but again, just as a recap, um, the Dondra Wolf point is um, the unique limit point um, of phi in the in the closed disk, such that the iterates will denote those as phi sub n converge um, uniformly on compact subsets of the disk. And it's important here to note that phi is not the identity or an elliptic automorphism because then we wouldn't have the iterates converging if that were the case. Um, and so Cowan and McClure give this intertwining of functions and I'm not gonna go into too much depth about the individual functions, but um, it turns out that we can do this intertwining um, where we can find, um, these functions, um, I guess we've called this capital phi and sigma, um, where phi is a map on either a half plane or the whole complex plane. Um, sigma maps the disk 
to either the half plane or the complex plane that um, phi is related to. Sigma and phi are univalent on a fundamental set V and sigma of V is a fundamental set for capital V. So the goal here is um, in this intertwining is to sort of classify different cases um, that are functions phi sort of fall into in this model. And then it turns out that there are only four possible cases. And so um, I'll give some examples of them. Some of them are very straightforward and some of them are a little more, what they might seem a little more convoluted. But we have these four cases, um, we'll call them plane dilation, plane translation, half plane dilation and half plane translation. And so in the plane dilation case, um, for example, if we have V of Z to be S times Z, then we can let capital Phi just be the original function Phi and Sigma of Z is just Z. Um, and then we have some other examples here that I'm not gonna go through every, every one, but I will just point out that in the half plane translation case, um, I find this one particularly interesting just because of, of how we can come up with such a function. Um, and it really has to do by uh, taking compositions of um, sort of more elementary functions and then coming up with this V of Z. And so um, if we take, um, I'll just call this function Psi of Z to be what's under this square root in what I've called sigma, um, right? This, just that part under the root maps the disk to the upper half plane. Um, and so then our sigma here takes um, the disk um, into the first quadrant. And if phi of, oops, uh, phi of Z, capital phi of Z here should be Z plus one. Um, also um, maps the upper half plane to itself. And when we take these compositions in, in the right ways, um, in particular, we're gonna let phi of z be sigma inverse composed with sigma plus one, um, then this is what we get, or I should say maybe sigma inverse composed with capital phi composed with sigma of z gets this, um, gets this function here. So it's, I think not the most obvious example why this is in this half plane translation case, um, where again, this half plane, the upper half plane is um, a fundamental set for our capital phi function. But um, what I think is interesting is, you know, we could of course identify all of the Donjoy Wolf points in all of these cases. And um, in our half plane translation case in particular, um, if we, you know, just go through the computation, the Donjoy Wolf point is one, and it's a deriv the, the derivative of phi at one is also one. And we can get, you know, sort of a combination of other Donjoy Wolf points and derivatives in the other three cases. But I just, I don't know, I think this is just such a strange example. <laughs> I just wanted to point it out. So the reason for this model that Catlin and McClure McClure give is because a lot of um, the other results that we um, that we get for properties of composition operators are uh, really built from this model and have to um, deal with uh, the Donjal Wolf point. And so we have sort of this nice framework to refer back to um, when we're working with the Donjal Wolf points. Okay, in particular, one of the results we can write down um, is this one on the spectral radius of a composition operator on the Hardy space. And so if the Donjal Wolf point is in the disk, then the spectral radius is one. 
And if the Dandre Wolf point is on the circle, then the spectral radius is um, the derivative of phi at the Dandre Wolf point um, to the minus one half. So one over root phi prime of A. Um, and in particular, we can write down a lot of the spectra for different types of composition operators. Um, so the first ones they give here are just on the automorphisms of the disk. And so um, if phi is elliptic, then the spectrum is the closure of the powers of phi prime of A. So of course that includes zero and one. Um, if phi is a hyperbolic automorphism on the disk, then the fixed point is, um, is on the circle. And um, here we get an annulus for the spectrum um, where the modulus of, of an eigenvalue lambda or a point in the spectrum lambda is between phi prime of a to the one half and phi prime of a to the negative one half. And then if phi is a parabolic automorphism, um, again, the fixed point will be on the circle, then the spectrum is just the unit circle. So those are, I think, some really nice results on the automorphisms, right? We can classify exactly what the spectra are for the uh, corresponding composition operators with those symbols. Um, and it turns out we can do more, but um, many of the other functions we know um, whose corresponding composition operators are CP, um, they're really built from compositions of automorphisms and, and other um, other functions, sort of more basic functions that we know. Um, but again, um, we will sort of relate uh, what we know back to the Donjal Wolf points. And again, the, the proofs for many of these go back to that model of iteration. And so if, um, if CFE is compact, then the spectrum is just the powers of phi prime of A, where A is the Donjal Wolf point. Um, so again, that of course that includes zero and one. And um, if phi um, just has a Donjal Wolf point in the disk, then the spectrum is this disk, uh, this closed disk um, of radius rho where rho is the essential spectral radius of C phi. Um, and also we union that with all the powers of phi prime of A. If phi is an inner function with a Donja Wolf point again in the disk, then the spectrum is um, the closed unit disk. But if phi is inner and the Donja Wolf point is on the circle, then the spectrum is, um, is the disk of radius uh, phi prime of A to the minus one half. Um, and that's the same spectrum if um, instead of an inner function, we just have phi being um, an analytic self map of the disk, um, again with a Donja Wolf point on the circle and phi prime of A being less than one. So these aren't all the results, but I think these are some of um, the nicest ones where um, we can write these down very quickly. And um, yes, I, th I think that's perhaps all I want to say about the, the different spectrums, the spectra of um, different composition operators. So again, this doesn't cover like all the cases, um, but I think gives a pretty robust view of you know, how we can write down some of, some of these spectra. Okay, so now I'll sort of move into the second half of the talk, which will focus on adjoints of composition operators. And so we define this in sort of the usual um, operator theory way <laughs> with the inner product. Um, so we'll call CV star the adjoint. Um, and it's defined where if we take the inner product of C phi star F with G, um, then that's the inner product of F with C phi of G. Um, and here again, we'll focus um, mainly on the Hilbert space and the Bergman space. So 
because of um, this inner product way that we can represent CP star F um, of Z, um, right, we can again just take the inner product with um, the reproducing kernel KZ with CP star F. Then we can use our integral representations of those inner products. My main goal has been to find the kernels of these adjoints. And so, right, what, what would we do? We would, we would set these integrals equal to zero and then hopefully solve for F. But it turns out that um, solving these integrals is not so straightforward. So we'd like sort of a, um, a better approach or maybe a better formula for understanding the adjoints of these composition operators on our classical spaces. Um, so just a few other preliminaries. Um, I think we all know a linear fractional transformation will have the form AZ plus B over CZ plus D um, where the determinant is not zero. And then um, our toplets operators, for us will just be a multiplication operator. Um, and so it turns out that um, on the Hardy and the Bergman space, if phi is a linear fractional map, then the adjoint C phi star um, is really just this combination of toplets operators with another a different composition operator. So we see here C phi star is T G C sigma T H star. Where here, um, C sigma is this expression. And um, again, in the Hardy space and the Bergman space, these are very similar, um, where we'll say G of Z is negative B bar Z plus D bar, so right, just like this denominator. And then H of Z is C Z plus D. And so we get this, um, this sort of breakdown of what the adjoint looks like in terms of, well, the adjoint of a toplets operator, which is really just um, the toplets operator whose symbol is the complex conjugate of H, and then an actual composition operator with sim symbol sigma. And um, it turns out that in this situation, the kernel of C phi star is zero. And you know, if you just sort of work through, if we apply what C phi star is to F, um, then the toplets operator, um, the kernel of, of TH star is, is zero. And then right, we just sort of like work through here and, and find that um, the only function that satisfies this equation is if F is identically zero. So we have some examples when the kernel of the adjoint of CV star is, is trivial. And that's maybe not so interesting. <laughs> um, and so we wanna know like, are there composition operators whose adjoints have non-trivial kernel? And in, in fact, that's true. Um, if phi is not univalent, then the kernel of CV star is infinite dimensional. And um, again, I'll sort of just outline the proof here quickly for us. Um, so one thing we know, again, we can write out with our, um, in our product, um, is C phi star applied to K alpha is just K um, of phi alpha. And um, if phi is not univalent, then there are two points in the disk um, that get mapped to the same point. So if we look at the difference then of the kernel functions um, with alpha and beta, as our points from the disk, then in fact, that's in the kernel of C phi star. And since again, phi is not univalent on the disk, in fact, there are infinitely many points around this alpha and beta um, where we can create these, difference of, um, these differences of reproducing kernels. And in fact, the, the closure of the span of this set um, Let me say that a little bit differently. Um, we don't yet know if the closure of the span of this set is the entire kernel, but we do know that it's infinite dimensional. 
and I guess one other thing I skipped over, but um, is hopefully clear that um, our reproducing kernel functions are linearly independent. And so the differences of, of, lin of sorry, the differences of um, different reproducing um, kernel functions are also linearly independent. Okay, this is just a quick result um, to say that the span of phi to the n is dense in the range of C phi. Um, and in particular, if C phi is bounded, which we know it always is on the Hardy space and the Bergman space, then, oh, I don't know why those are T's here. <laughs> the kernel of C phi star um, is just gonna be the orthogonal complement of the range of C phi star. So again, we have some examples of uh, when the kernel is non-trivial. And so a lot of um, the work that I had done in my PhD years <laughs> was to classify um, different uh, kern kernels or the kernels of um, different composition operator adjoints. Um, so again, we're working here towards what I call a better adjoint formula on the Hardy space. That was not just um, our integral formula. And in 2008, Hammond, Morehouse, and Robbins um, had formalized this formula for CP star on the Hardy space. And I won't go through too many of the details, but I will provide um, a couple of examples. So um, we're going to define the sigma of Z to be the reciprocal of the conjugate of phi inverse of 1 over Z bar. And we'll define this function psi of Z to be Z times sigma prime over sigma. And then we take phi of infinity. Um, to be, of course, the limit of phi of z as the modulus of z goes up to infinity. And it turns out then that um, with those functions, we can write this very nice adjoint formula for C phi star on the Hardy space um, that has to do with, um, again, the value of phi at infinity um, and then also um, just like this sort of invertibility property of, of phi as well. And we'll notice that, um, you know, if phi is not one to one, then sigma in fact is multi-valued. And so this um, sum that we're taking here is over the different branches of sigma that come again from the, from the inverse of phi. So, if we just take a look at this example again with uh, perhaps not what, what might not look like too complicated um, of a phi. Uh, so if we have one half times the quantity z squared plus z, this is um, a map of the dis to itself. And we do this computation for, for sigma and for psi. And so um, again, we get two different branches here. Um, and we'll just call them sigma one and sigma two. Um, I think unsurprisingly, one has the positive square root and one has the negative square root. And then um, again, psi one is gonna be Z times sigma one prime over sigma one. And then similarly for psi two. And these are the functions that we get. Um, and I won't uh, bore you with all these details of how to actually find those things, but you, you know, we can work through those computationally. Um, but the point is that we can find these, but um, I still don't think it's necessarily clear how we can use those to find the kernel of C V star. And so um, my work has extended this just a little bit, um, but only for very particular <laughs> functions for phi that are um, degree two and rational. And so we can uh, introduce yet another function. I'm gonna call it zeta of Z. And again, this looks a little familiar, um, right? This might look very similar to sigma, but this is um, phi inverse of phi of one over z bar, right? So sigma um, in the Hammond, Morehouse, and Robbins theorem didn't have this phi right here. Um, but it turns out that this function for zeta, if we have this degree two rational map for our symbol phi, um, it's a linear fractional map 
that maps um, the different branches of sigma to the other, or, you know, they maps it to themselves. And, um, and then we can see that this function zeta composed with itself is the identity. And so again, I'll sort of skip the details here of the proof. If we look back at our example, um, then we've sort of turned uh, phi of z, which was again, this second degree rational map into something that's just with this linear fractional map. Um, and it turns out for this one, zeta of z is negative z over z plus one. And so we can use that with this theorem to actually help us classify the functions in the kernel of C phi star for more symbols phi than we knew before. Um, and so in fact, F is in the kernel of C phi star if and only if this um, functional equation holds. And again, we notice that this equation only depends on zeta, which came from the coefficients of our symbol phi. Um, again, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I, I haven't thought um, too deeply about a lot of this work um, unless it's been with my students over the last few summers. And so um, a couple of my students, Anna and Laura, in the summer of 2017 um, sat down um, for their summer research project and um, wrote down all the possibilities that this zeta function could take. And so there, it really only boiled down to five possibilities. And as they were working on that, um, they also came across some sufficient conditions on the coefficients of um, phi being this second degree rational map so that it maps the disk to itself. And um, it turns out in particular, uh, we know a couple of things when um, zeta of z is one of these first two functions. So if we take a look here um, at our symbol z squared plus one over two, this is a two to one map. And if we find zeta from our formula, it's going to be negative z. And it turns out that the kernel of C phi star then is just the odd functions in the Hardy space. Oops. Um, and in fact, any um, symbol that has this corresponding zeta being negative z will have um, always uh, their, the kernel of C phi star being the odd functions in the Hardy space. And again, we can sort of just work through the computation through this um, functional equation, right? We just plug in negative z and its derivative of negative one, and we just do some rearranging and see, yes, indeed, we'll always get the odd functions. And so um, that, you know, describes a lot of that describes the kernel C phi star for now, a larger class of symbols for phi. Um, here I've given an example of a symbol that's um, not two to one, but also not univalent on the disk. And this is a little more unclear. <laughs> uh, we haven't um, entirely written down what the kernel of C phi star looks like other than knowing that um, if F is in the kernel, then it has to satisfy this functional equation. But my students, um, because they're, they weren't too advanced <laughs> in, um, in their mathematical careers at that point of doing this research, they instead looked at this problem in a few different ways. And so they turned um, this functional equation into um, really this sort of eigenvalue equation, eigenvalue eigenfunction equation with a toplitz operator and then a composition operator. Um, and they wrote down this matrix for, um, for that operator. And we see that one and negative one are eigenvalues. And of course that eigenspace associated with one is gonna give us the kernel of C phi star since we were really trying to solve this equation here. 
Um, on the other hand, they tried it another way <laughs> by um, finding the matrix representation of CFE star, which is just the conjugate transpose of CFE. And so we see the powers of um, one half along the diagonal here, which is um, the derivative at the Donjal Wolf point. And so, of course, this is what we would expect to be on the diagonal um, because of what we know the spectrum to be um, for CFE. And so, um, again, their goal was to try to find the null space of this type of matrix to get the kernel of CFE star. But if I remember correctly, they didn't get very far because, <laughs> again, they didn't quite know how to deal with, um, with infinite dimensional things. And then um, just one more highlight from one of my students that I'll share is the second form of the zeta function being negative the quantity alpha plus z. Um, so if our, uh, again, second degree rational symbol has this corresponding zeta function, um, then f is in the kernel of CP, if f is in the kernel of CP star, um, then f is a polynomial of odd degree. And in fact, um, I'll just, I'll end on this set of pretty pictures here that my student created. So um, if we have, um, again, this uh, sort of, I think, unassuming <laughs> function z squared over z plus two, we find that its corresponding zeta is negative, the quantity one half plus z. Um, so phi maps the unit circle um, onto this image where um, we have some winding numbers of two and then, um, right, just a part where it's one, one to one. And um, through um, the student's computations, um, there was a relationship between the different coefficients of um, polynomials that were in the kernel. But we see that the behavior of all these functions is slightly different. And so I just wanted to highlight that because um, it, there's, you know, really no... Uh, pattern, I, I don't think that we can see here, um, that would help us recover um, all of the functions um, in this particular kernel. We know how to find them, uh, how to find polynomials um, of odd degree, because we can find the relationships be between the coefficients. But, um, but beyond that, I'm not sure really how we can classify the rest of the kernel of this type of CV star. Okay, so I'll end there. Um, thank you so much for listening. And um, should I stop sharing my screen for yeah, questions? I'm gonna right now. Thank you, Brittany. Okay, yeah.